We begin this morning in South Carolina. That is where thousands of people gathered at an arena in Charleston last night to remember those nine victims shot and killed inside of a church on Wednesday night. We all have one thing in common. Our hearts are broken. That service capping an emotional day in Charleston, a day in which the gunman in that shooting, Dylan Roof, appeared in court via satellite for the first time. Roof appearing, it's a video conference actually. He was formally charged with nine counts of murder. Uh, he's being held on $1 million bond on a separate gun charge. He's not due to appear in court again until October. Now, authorities say that Roof confessed to the killings shortly after being arrested on Thursday in North Carolina. Sources telling NBC News that he told police he almost didn't go through with the shooting because everyone at the church was so nice to him. Ultimately, though, he did decide to go through with that shooting. The chief prosecutor in Charleston County says he wants to talk to the victims' families and review the evidence before deciding whether to seek the death penalty. But South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley called Wednesday's attack a hate crime, says she's already made up her mind. We will absolutely will want him to have the death penalty. This is the worst hate that I've seen and that the country has seen in a long time. We will fight this and we will fight this as hard as we can. All right, we have two reporters live in Charleston this morning. Adam Reese is outside the Emanuel AME Church. That is where the shooting happened. But we start by going to Tremaine Lee, who is live at the Charleston County Detention Center. That is where Dylan Roof is being held. So, Tremaine, yesterday uh, we got our, our first sort of uh, formal proceedings involving Dylan Roof. What is the road forward legally look like from here? Legally speaking, uh, Steve, this is just the beginning. Uh, a judge set a $1 million bond on the gun charge, but he said he did not have the authority to set any bail on the nine murder charges that Dylan Roof faces. Now, hours before thousands of people gathered outside of that church, Dylan Roof was he appeared via uh, live circuit, uh, closed circuit television. And for the first time, we heard the family members of the victims, of his victims, speak. And they spoke of great pain and great anguish, saying that they welcomed him into their church for Bible study, but they took from him, uh, took from them so much more than they could ever uh, get back. Um, and, and for the first time again, that we saw that outpouring of grief from the family. Now, uh, Dylan Roof's family also released a statement saying that they are shocked and saddened by what happened. Um, yet still, as this community is still reeling. Uh, Dylan Roof will begin this process. Again, there will be other bond hearings for the other charges. And still, this community is piecing together slowly um, everything that Dylan Roof has taken from them. And, and Adam Reese, uh, outside the church, let me bring you in. in. In terms of what the reaction is from the community, can you set the scene for what last night was like, what we can be expecting today and this weekend? Well, it's a lot more of vigils, funerals, more mourning. We're seeing a steady stream of people come here by the church to pay their respects. A lot of emotion here. I want to talk to you also about the arrest warrant, what we're learning from that. We're learning that he walked into this church behind me with a fanny pack. He sat with the Bible study group. He sat right next to Pastor Pinckney. After about an hour, he stood up. He opened fire, hitting the victims multiple times. And on his way out, he stood over one of the surviving victims and uttered some sort of a racist comment. We're also learning the pastor's wife and youngest daughter were in the church office at the time. They could hear the shooting. They called 911, and the 911 operator told them to stay inside. And finally, it was the father and uncle of Dylan Roof who called police and identified him in the photo, said that is Dylan Roof, and he has a 45 caliber handgun. Steve? All right, thank you to Adam Reese, Tremaine Lee in Charleston, South Carolina. Appreciate the time. As Tremaine just mentioned, despite dealing with the sudden grief and sadness of losing loved ones, many of the victims' families have amazingly been able to find forgiveness toward the gunman. They addressed him directly during his appearance in court yesterday. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. But God forgive you. I forgive you. You have killed some of the most beautiful people that I know. Every fiber in my body hurts. And, and I'll never be the same. But as we say in a Bible study, we enjoyed you. But may God have mercy on you. That we are 
the family that love built. We have no room for hate, so we have to forgive. I pray God on your soul. We're joined now by the Reverend Stephen Singleton, Senior Minister at Grace Heritage Ministries. He was a pastor at Emmanuel AME Church from 2006 to 2010. Reverend, thank you for taking some time this morning. So that, that scene yesterday, I, I got to watch that live on television yesterday afternoon. Uh, if people who haven't seen that, I encourage you to go watch the whole thing because it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, uh, one family member after another uh, uh, from these, uh, these victims' families getting up and speaking of mercy, of love, and forgiveness. And, and I think my reaction and the reaction of, of so many people watching this was yesterday, it, it, was, it was inspiring in a way, but also unfathomable in a way, uh, imagining ourselves in a situation like that, not being able to summon those kinds of emotions I was so proud of them on yesterday um, they led with their faith and we have a passage in the Bible that says nothing shall separate us from the love of God and they they lived that yesterday they proved to the world that nothing can separate us from his love and I think they made a statement for the ages for the world and for the faith that we profess I felt like a proud father because I knew the voices that were speaking and I was just happy and I'm, gra I'm, so, I'm so grateful that they were able to hold on to their faith because it doesn't matter uh, what we say or do now, we can't change what happened on Wednesday night. So I'm just, I'm just happy for the faith and I'm happy that they held on to their faith. Yeah, I mean, and the other sort of extraordinary thing about that scene yesterday is that the shooter he has to listen and he has to watch. He has to listen and, and, and watch as these family members step forward and, and say these things. What do you hope he heard? What do you hope he took from that yesterday? I hope he learned and everybody who may feel the way that he feels, I hope that they learn that, that uh, there are agents of hate, but they cannot overpower the ambassadors for love. And I, I hope that he understands now that that what he did was horribly wrong, that he attacked some, some wonderful people with wonderful families, and uh, if they want to change the world, um, they, they need to change it in a positive direction because uh, hatred never wins. Love always wins in the end. You know, Adam Reese was just reporting some more of the details from what happened Wednesday night. And this is a church, obviously, you know, you know very well, having worked there in the past. I'm, I'm wondering about an event like this on Wednesday nights. So this looks like it's, it's a relatively small group. It's a Bible study group. Seems like it's a fairly close-knit group. And this guy just shows up who's never been there before. He has a fanny pack. He walks in. He prays with them for an hour. Was this something, is this something that's common at, at, at a session like that? Somebody who the group doesn't know showing up and saying, I want to pray with you tonight? Or, or was that a... a warning flag maybe in a way no it is very very common for strangers to walk into mother Emmanuel um, that church is known internationally because of its history and we have people from all over the world to drop in at Emmanuel and regardless of what's going on they join in and I understand I, I can picture in my mind how welcoming they were uh, the people who were in that room that night were some of the most wonderful people you'll ever want to meet I know they, they, they showed him kindness they welcomed him and um, his presence was not unusual strangers are joining them at all times and um, and I wish that he had listened to the voice of God because he uh, unofficially he said that uh, he, he gave it a second thought before he carried out his plan and I believe that um, that, that, that that was God's voice talking to him and he just didn't listen. And I wonder, Reverend, how, how this will affect you and, and, and your fellow pastors out there going forward. I mean, that, that just sort of, that atmosphere of openness you're describing at, at that church and in other churches, when somebody takes advantage of it like that to commit something as, as horrible as this, does that change your thinking? Does that change your approach towards having a, you know, a Bible study group like that or just having such an open door policy in the future? I think that um, we'll definitely give it some thought. I think my colleagues and, and other congregations, and of course that one, um, we will have some, some discussions, we'll talk about it. But I do know that the kingdom has to remain open. The kingdom will always be open to others. Um, so we'll, 
we'll deal with it accordingly. I have a, um, an event at my church this morning. I've already gotten a couple of calls about that as, as to how we're going to approach it. But, um, but we're open to God's people and, and we have to do that. Uh, but I'm sure we'll, we'll be very, very aware of new faces, uh, but we have to welcome them in anyway. All right, Reverend Stephen Singleton, thank you for taking a few minutes this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. God bless. All right. We will have much more ahead this morning from Charleston, also from the world of politics. But before we get to that, we've heard a lot in recent days about the Reverend Clementa Pinckney. He's the pastor of the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church who was killed on Wednesday. A state senator, someone President Obama himself knew, among the nine people shot and dead and killed during Bible study at Emanuel AME. Now, we are learning more about the other victims of Wednesday night's massacre as well. People like Sharonda Coleman Singleton, a reverend at the church and a mother of three. Most people, though, calling her Coach Singleton. She coached the track and field team at Goose Creek High School outside of Charleston. She was also a speech therapist at that school in the field at Goose Creek yesterday. A landscaper drawing the initials SS in the field. SS for Sharonda Singleton. She was 45 years old.